place on people who disobey. But authority is adhered to because of fear of the law. The next concept of government is legitimacy. Very quickly, we want to say that legitimacy is the approval of authority. People could have authority, but when such authority does not gain the approval of the masses, it cannot be legitimately used. So, legitimacy becomes the approval of one's authority. We want to talk about factors that determine legitimacy. Any government can gain legitimacy if it meets the socio-economic expectation of its people. A government that is welfareist in nature would easily win the legitimacy of the people. Again, legitimacy is conferred on a government through written rules and regulation of the land, which could be found in the Constitution. And finally, legitimacy can be obtained through the consent of the people. When the government is elected by the people, automatically such government wins the consent of the people and is thus legitimate. We want to now talk about legitimacy as a factor of stability. Any government that does not gain the legitimacy or the consent, if you like, of its people would not be stable. If the authority and power exercised by the leaders are not legitimate, then the government cannot maintain stability. So, any government that expects to be stable must work at earning the legitimacy of the masses. And this is very, very important. The next concept of government we shall be talking about is sovereignty. And this has to do with the state of political independence. A state is said to be sovereign if such state is free to make its laws and implement them without interference from external bodies. Again, sovereignty is the supreme power of the state. And of course, this takes from the first idea that the sovereignty is a state of political independence. When a state has the supreme power to execute their laws, such state is said to be sovereign state. There is a problem in locating sovereignty. And we want to consider these problems. First, it is difficult to know who is sovereign. Is it the people? Is it the constitution? Or the military? Again, sovereignty cannot be absolute, considering the fact that no nation is an island. The sovereignty of a state stops where the sovereignty of another state begins, given the fact that Every nation must one way or the other interact with the other. And again, if the electorate created a sovereign body, then it ceases to be sovereign. The question now is between the constitution created by the people and the people who created the constitution, who has the sovereign power? Of course, I said earlier that these are the problems of locating sovereignty. The next is limitation of sovereignty. We have said earlier that the sovereignty of a state is limited externally by the rights of other states. Another limiting factor of sovereignty is international law and treaties with foreign powers. When nations sign treaties with powers with, with other countries, in a way, they cede their sovereignty to such states. The next thing that limits the sovereignty of a nation or the sovereign powers of a nation is foreign aids. Of course, every nation would one way or the other do the billions of nations that provide foreign aids to them. If that is the case, then the sovereignty of such states is limited because oftentimes, Nations that provide aid to other nations, one way or the other, want to interfere in their policy making and implementation to favor them. The next concept of government is democracy. It's a term that is almost a household term. Oftentimes, here we would define democracy as the government of the people, by the people, and for the people, according to Abraham Lincoln. 
But we want to see democracy as government by selected representative of the people for the good of the people. So a government is said to be democratic only when the people are involved in selection of the people representing them. Such government is said to be democratic. We want to talk about the futures of democracy. One, and very, very important, is free and fair elections. A state is said to be democratic when there is free and fair election. An election is said to be free and fair when everyone has the right to vote, everyone who is qualified has the right to vote and does so. It is equally free and fair when the arena, arena for voting is free from uh, intimidation. The next future of democracy is periodic election. Yes, periodic election affords the masses of the citizens the opportunity to elect new people to represent them if they discover that the people representing them hitherto have not been doing well. In that case, they will wait for the next election to vote them out and vote in the people, the next people of their choice. So periodic election is essentially one of the most important futures of democracy. The next future of democracy is the right to oppose. Yes, a democratic state affords people the right to make constructive criticism. And such constructive criticism helps to put the government of the day on their toes so that they are able to carry out the desires of the people and formulate policies that would help the people positively. The next concept of government is political culture. When we talk about culture, actually, it has to do with the totality of people's way of life. Now, when we talk about political culture, it has to do with people's way of life as it relates to politics. So people's attitudes, beliefs, emotions, and values of their society that relates to politics is referred to as political culture. The next concept is political socialization. All of the processes through which an individual gains information and experiences about his society is known as political socialization. Now, agents of political socialization. The agents of political socialization are the processes through which someone or an individual gets politically socialized. The first is, of course, the family. The mother, the father, one way or the other, impacts on the child. So, a child gets to learn about his society probably first from his parents. The second is the school. At school, students are taught a whole lot about their society. They get to learn about the government of the day through the study of government as a field of study in the school. The next is the mass media. The newspaper, the radio, the television. When we read the newspaper, listen to the radio, and watch the television, we get to hear stories about what is happening around the town. And that way, we get into the system, we get to learn. And again, there's the church, and of course the mosque. We get socially, we get politically socialized through these means too. Now, let's talk about communism, or rather, communalism. Yes, it's a form of government. We are no longer talking about the concept of government now. We are not talking about forms of government. And the first is communalism. This is a form of government where resources of the state are pulled together. And when these resources are pulled together, the entire people of the state benefit. Such is a system of government that was practiced in the pre-colonial system of the Igbo society, where resources are brought together and evenly distributed. Of course, in Babylonia times, a number of people, that's the Christians who lived after Jesus Christ, practiced a form of communism, sorry, communalism, where members were to bring their resources together and the apostles distributed based on individual needs. 